And he went a little over the top. He said, what are the top five technical skills and top five soft skills that you consider? For, for the sake of time and interest, we're going to go top three, top three, if you can pull that. Top three tech skills, top three soft skills. What do you look for? Tech skills is going to be SQL, uh, Tableau, and then Python. Awesome. And then soft skills is is going to be that storytelling that, that we were talking about earlier. Um, I want somebody that's able to, I don't know, communication is really broad, but that, that's a huge one as well. But negotiation, I think negotiation is, is not talked about and, and not really well understood. But if, if folks are interested in listening and looking for a resource, never split the difference by Chris Voss. Yeah. It's a rock solid book. For you um, elaborate on that a little bit? What, do you, what does negotiation look like? Well, I mean, I was about to say negotiating salary probably, but <laughs> how could you showcase your negotiation ability? Because what I worry is that it's going to be seen as like you're overly disagreeable or you're abrasive. Abrasive? By negotiating, like if you're, if you're, well, especially, it, I guess it depends on if I am an entry level analyst and I'm coming in and I'm trying to negotiate with you, it's like, well, buddy, you don't have any leverage here. Leverage? You, you said negotiation, right? I did. And so what I did there was just even just mirroring the last word that you were saying. Those are techniques that Chris Voss teaches in his negotiations. And it's it's not necessarily confrontational, right? It it's how do I get more information out of the other party with some of these different techniques, right? And uh, it, it's it really is about collaboration. True negotiations about collaboration because as a as a hiring manager, you're looking for talent. You're looking for somebody that can actually do the role and. I didn't really talk about the third aspect that I'm looking for, but at the end of the day, as a hiring manager, if you're a good technical fit, good cultural fit, are you going to be like the best candidate to for me to hire? Is kind of like this this final fit. I'm not even sure how you describe it, but the fit is: are you going to make me look good as a hiring manager? And yeah. I don't people even think about that. But you're, if I hire you, you work for me, are you going to make me look like a rock star or are you going to make me look bad, right? Yeah, it's almost like you would call that like social, socially competent. Like can you read situations? Do you know your worth? Are you unafraid to, you know, have confrontation from time to time? Because what happens if you don't, if you're never conf if you're non-confrontational, you know, you let that go, you let that go, you let that go, and then all of a sudden there's a big blow up. I mean, th those people are actually kind of hard to work with if if um, they're not letting you know where they're at. And I think that negotiation is that that's a new one. I haven't I have to I have to kind of ponder that one. Um, yeah, I think that's I like it. Well, that's so important for the candidates and the folks that you guys are talking to that need to hone and develop that skill. As a hiring manager looking for that skill, typically you hear them ask questions. Tell me about a time where you had a conflict with so and so. How did you resolve it? Right, like that's the textbook mm -hmm. interview question. But that's looking for negotiation skills, conflict resolution. That's that's exactly what negotiation is, right? How do you resolve a conflict? How do you deal with a tough situation, a tough conversation? So, yeah, the, those would be my top three for the soft skills side. Okay. Well, Gus is usually in the chat on Fridays. So if, uh, if, he, if he wants the full five for both, uh, he'll have his opportunity to ask you. Five is tough. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you can do two more tech skills. Soft skills, yeah, that, that sometimes you start getting a little weird there. Yeah. So uh, another newcomer, Sonny Lizaraga, and I hope I said his name right. But uh, So he's asking about, um, I think about the ATS, and about job listings and all of those sometimes crazy uh, requirements and nice to haves that they have on there. So he wants to know if it's important to meet 100% of the qualifications on a job listing. And if he's falling a little bit short of meeting all of those bullets, is it worth his while to apply? So I will tell you both 
from a hiring perspective and internal being the on the other end of the process, I don't think I've ever met 100% of any of those hiring requirements to get into any of the roles yeah. that I've been in. And, and so it, it's more, is this person got the minimal technical requirements and are they trainable? Do they learn? Can they adapt? Because I can tell you whatever you do on day one is going to be different from what you day, do on day 100 and 1000, right? Like you, you're just going to change. You're going to adapt. The business is always constantly growing and adapting and changing. So you've got to be able to do that if you want to be valuable to the organization. And, and those are folks that I'd be looking for too. Okay. So follow up question. And I'm, we've batted this around a couple of times. Um, how do you how do you demonstrate or how do you explain in an interview that you're a good learner? Because everybody says I learn quickly. Everybody thinks that. Um, truth is, most people probably learn at about the same rate. How, how do you express that to an interviewer that that you're willing to learn? Um, I think saying that you're willing to learn is, is great. Um, if you can talk about a project where maybe you didn't know everything going in, and then okay. explain that, well, we made these assumptions when we went into the project we found out this was not true and so we had to adapt we had to make this change in the process that's one way to demonstrate that the other way i think is not necessarily focus on the learning but focus on what the objective for the business is so a good question to ask would be so help me understand you know what are some of the future objectives or strategic priorities that the you know you would see somebody in this role helping to accomplish helping you to accomplish you know what what are some of the things that you see and you what's your vision for how we could be successful in this role because it's getting me to look forward and think about you know what is this person doing you know how are they going to be successful so it's not just these are what i need you to start with it's what do I need to, what other skills do I, should I be looking to develop to be successful in this role? When you ask for looking questions like that, it, it tells me that you're not stagnant. I'm not just hiring you to, you know, just type in some code and be done. Like you're, you're actually looking for growth potential. So asking questions like that about that future looking forward looking, uh, I think helps to demonstrate that a lot. Okay, awesome. Yeah, no, that, that one comes up over and over again. and Seems to be a bit of a stumper for a lot of people. But yeah, I think bringing up a past project is, is, is a great one. Um, so friend of the show, Shruti Jain, representing the great city of Chennai, India. Uh, she says, uh, what are the things we should avoid talking about or actions we should avoid doing in an interview? Um, I know we kind of talked about a couple of landmines that, that you see people trip on. What are some other examples of of kind of poor practices to avoid. I guess when when you're telling your story, and we talked about bragging a little bit, but there there's a distinction between telling the stories and the facts and, and your contribution and taking all the credit in a story. And if, if I hear a lot of statements like, well, I did this and I did this and I did this, and then we were able to do, and then ultimately this is what happened, and there's no we, there's no we did this and we did this. And, you know, together with my team, we were able to accomplish this. Then that's a red flag to me that this person is not a team player or they're just in it for themselves. They're, they're a glory taker, right? And, and we want people that are contributing to, to the team and to the organization. So that, okay. that one for me is a big red flag. Got it. Um, so Abe Diaz, who is a, a super fan of the show, we call him the data Marine. So he submitted a video question. Um, I transcribed it verbatim because I've gone through some catastrophic, uh, tech failures here in, in the household. Um, I, I'll do my best. It sounds better when he says it, cause he looks like Drake and I don't, uh, but I'll give him a best shot. So Alex, thanks for coming and bestowing your wisdom upon us. He said, what is the best way to explain a project in an interview? To explain a project? I think it goes back to what we were saying before, you know, talk about it at a high level about the impact first. 
and then look for the engagement from the interviewer to dive deeper in. Don't don't start at the low level technical details unless it's asked for. So that that might be what we we were able to accomplish this project in. Now, ultimately, it was able to save the organization thirty million dollars a year, or, or you know, uh, and they're like, "Wow, that's a big number! How how did you do that?" It's like, well, the process went like this and this, and we were able to collaborate with these several organizations within the company, and we were able to work out this process. And and if you like, I could talk through some of the more technical aspects of that as well. You just kind of let the other person go as deep or as low as they want. And I might be like, no, I think that that's good. That's impressive. Uh, I can see that yeah. a lot of collaboration and coordination, you know, but yeah, I, I would definitely start high level, work your way down. So it's almost like you give your project an elevator pitch. And then if they ask for it, you go into the, tell me about yourself or your project. Absolutely. That I think you said it perfectly. You, you really want that elevator pitch position so that it sells the project. Because if you're not selling it and they're not asking, then you probably did do a great job of describing the project yeah. and the benefits that it played. Yeah. Well, I think it also gets back to that point of that you're kind of hitting on with negotiation of it almost shows insecurity that I need to show you my skills. And it's like, well, yeah, there's a time and a place for that. But if you're like pushing that when I'm asking for your impact and you're like, but Python, but coding, but automation it kind of, it shows a lack of, I, I think I see what you're saying, like that that social competency. Awesome, Al, was that the last question? Or you got one we more? have one more. So okay. the fifth and final question was actually originally a question to me. Um, I was woefully inadequate trying to answer it. So uh, Archana Powell, uh, so she asked me, what are the main skills needed for business intelligence? I gave it my best shot and I said, but you should definitely ask Alex uh, on Friday. I'm going to jump the gun and just make her YouTube famous and ask you now. What do you think? Okay. Um, I think SQL is still foundational, no matter what BI tool that you're using. The more SQL background that you have, the easier it is to understand how to use the tool. It's not a prereq nowadays. These tools are drag and drop, but it helps a lot, if, especially if you want to be advanced and more proficient. You know, understanding... The difference between dimensions and measures is just at a high level, you know, what aggregations and how those work. And then data visualization, you know, learn the basics of the best practices, color schemas that work well in, in how to display data. There, there's, there's several good books out there that I highly recommend. Um, you know, good reference one is just a big book of dashboards and uh, yeah, there's a lot of visualization best practices, but it depends a lot on the tool that you're going to use. And I don't know really what else to say about that, but yeah, different advice for Tableau versus Click versus MicroStrategy versus Power BI, but Power BI and Tableau are probably the two uh, most dominant players in the BI space. And, and so I would say... Power BI over Tableau, even though I am a huge Tableau fan, but it's kind of like the Apple versus Android. Yeah. Microsoft is everywhere, so is Power BI. Tableau is like more like Apple. It's it's an extremely great product, but it's on the more expensive side, so sometimes enterprises don't have the appetite for that. Uh, that's that's my take on it. Got it. Awesome job, John David. Which one's better, Power BI or Tableau? Go. Oh, which one's better? Depends on who you ask. Um, okay, so what what the way that I explain it to my students is that Tableau is a visualization software that has data modeling tacked onto it, and Power BI is the opposite. So it's it's really good at data modeling. The visualization is okay. I I think that they both get the job done though, and yeah. you're right. I think that Power BI is probably going to be gaining more market share because of their distribution model. Everyone has Excel and it's the price point, but who knows? I mean, it, 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 there may be a, a toss up. What I generally tell people is don't hook your wagon to any one specific tool. Yeah. That's why I think SQL is still foundational and then understanding best practices 
um, around visualization. And then just a differentiation between whether you call it dimensions or attributes, measures or metrics, you know, if you understand that, you understand BI and that's really all it is. Awesome.